Hey, Hello, welcome. Everybody. Welcome back to Pacecast. So this is our uh, live podcast all about RC drifting every Tuesday night. Uh, we're pretty much on the dot, 8 o'clock uh, Central European time, 7 for you, those, those watching in the UK. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Thijs. I'm from NGORC, another channel you can find if you uh, Google it. And then uh, through the magic of the internet, on the other side of my screen is uh, James from RC Boss and of course this channel, Pace. So just as always, we have a bit of a program for you guys. Um, and as always, we have the live chat going as well. So if you want to interrupt, send some questions, send some comments, feel free to do so. We'll be watching uh, uh, the, ch the chat uh, live as well. And then uh, if we don't get to your questions right now, we'll uh, keep it for another time. Um, and today we have a bit of a topic. Um, we're going to talk about beginning with RC drifting. So yep. if you're interested in, uh, in RC drifting and you want to pick it up as a hobby, what do you do? Where to go? Um, maybe also who to listen to. <laughs> yeah. Maybe and, and also if you recently started, uh, there's probably some information you may not have in, uh, encountered just yet. Exactly. Yeah. So we're going to try and uh, help you out, help you get started, give some good advice that uh, maybe might be worth something. Uh, even if you watch this video uh, a year from now or a little bit later. Um, and also, if you have any tips while we're going through this all, uh, feel free to share in the chat so we can uh, we can share with everyone else watching as well. Yep. And if you're yeah. watching this after we're live, uh, drop it in the comments below because beginners will no doubt be sent to this, so they'll see it as well. Exactly. And for anything else, you can always do that too. So uh, so yeah. Um, let's uh, let's kick it off. I would say. Yeah. So I guess uh, where we start is what do you buy when you're looking to start out? When it's your you know when you're buying your first car where do you start uh for uh, me I, well i started with a touring car um which so, so did i yeah i think uh, a lot of people did especially yeah. back in the days yeah so i, I started in i think it was, i can't remember if it was 2010 or 2011 and i bought an old yokomo mr4 bd chris granger edition i think it was <laughs> that was an old touring car it was, the reason i bought it was because it was cheap on ebay um and well, I guess well, you started with a TTO one, a Tamiya. Uh, no, even older than that, even the TA01. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, uh, TA. The, this was before there was any drift version available whatsoever. Yeah. So you just got whatever you you had and tried to drift. But indeed, the next one was indeed a, a TTO one, like yeah. pretty much everyone around that time who started. See, having at the time when when we started, I definitely think. Um, well, I definitely think that we. Um, that was our kind of the best option we had. Um, there was this was before any sort of drift specific chassis were readily available, um, and um, I don't think I would ever recommend anyone now would go down that route. Uh, it's a, you might buy something very cheap, but you will spend an awful lot of money trying to make it work. Um, you'll also spend an awful lot of time trying to overcome problems and restrictions that you just don't get if you buy one of the entry level drift chassis. Um, they've come on such a long way now that actually for a lot of people buying a basic chassis is one of the best moves they could do because they just work. They're, they're designed for beginners. They're designed to work out of the box. You put them down and you drive and they work great uh, in general. Um, you might need some tweaking for different surfaces and things like that. Um, but in terms of just being able to enjoy the hobby, they're your best route by far. Um, it's it's a funny one because the amount of time that I spent making my touring car work, and this was when we were still running four wheel drive drifting. As soon as I I ended up breaking a couple of diffs, I ended up like spending ages making um, massive steering modifications to get me a bit more steering lock, and then I ended up breaking a couple of diffs, struggling to find replacements. So I ended up taking the plunge and buying a drift chassis because that at that point I knew I was in into the hobby. And this, that was when the Yokomo DIB first came out. And as soon as I got that, all of my problems went away and I could focus on <laughs> enjoying the hobby, driving, and just having fun with my friends. Um, and realistically, you're not saving that much money by going no. uh, going with the touring car. No. Because a starting kit, like a, a, like a basic chassis for drifting, uh, at the moment that would be the RMX2 or uh, the Yokomo YD2, something like that is around 200 euros maybe if you're lucky you can get it a little bit cheaper um any touring car that's worth your time even second hand is at least 100 um 
So yeah. you're not you're not going to save much. And, I mean, it, and e- the- even if you were given a touring car, um, you're going to end up spending a fair chunk of money on it to make it work. Um, you yeah. basically will have to redo the whole front steering, um, and then you still have to probably buy some the various different spare parts for it, maybe change the internal gearing, that kind of thing. And by the time you've done that, assuming you can get hold of the parts, if it's a modern enough chassis that they're they're still available, you're going to have spent a fair chunk of cash that will get you a lot closer to spending the same money. I mean, for example, the the ready-to-run um, RMX2 is about €350, Euros, which seems like an awful lot of money, but you just chuck a battery and charge with that and you're good to go. Um, and it just works. Like I say, that is down on the on the deck straight away on the chassis uh, on the circuit even and um you can just go and enjoy the hobby um and if, okay there's a lot of people out there that think that they'll enjoy making something work and building something and customizing something and there are those people but they can still do that with a better starting point you know they can still customize things they can still tweak things they can still m- make their own parts if they want to make their own parts but when you start with a better base you're you're not struggling to overcome a problem that is easy to overcome if you take a different route yeah no matter which basic kit you get um there's plenty of upgrades available so you'll be busy upgrading it uh tweaking it tuning it uh customizing it um as much as you'd like with readily available parts or indeed go custom but at least you have a good base to go off um and if we say a basic drift chassis we don't mean anything that says drift on the box, no. basically. Or um, anything that your local hobby shop tells you is a drift chassis. Um, unless your local hobby shop has a drift track with people who actually know what they're doing, then yes. it's uh, a good place to if, go. If your local hobby shop doesn't have somebody in the shop that regularly drifts once a month or more, um, they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to drifting, and they will sell you something that has drift on the box or their sales rep from a major manufacturer or distributor has told them is a drift chassis. Um, and the amount of people that we end up helping that have gone down that route and they sp- spend the exact same amount of money they would on a real drift chassis, but their car isn't capable or reliable or um, just in any way satisfying to use. Um, so, yeah, I think it's the best thing you can do is join some Facebook groups, look at some YouTube videos, look at some, maybe some uh, blogs or websites that you find from from local guys. The best thing you could actually do is attend the local track and ask people what your what what they recommend. Like I say, at the moment, I'd, there's no point for me anyone looking past an RMX2 or a YD2. Um, there are people that will go for the uh, the three racing D4. Um, I'm not a massive fan of them because I think they end up taking a little bit of work to get going, which is fine if you have the budget to do that. Um, it works out about the same as an RMX, maybe a fraction cheaper, but you need to be surrounded by people that know that chassis and know which parts to get because there's so many upgrade kits and parts available for that chassis that you can end up buying the wrong thing thinking it will help and in reality it's not what you needed um i think they're they are an okay chassis if you were given one they're great if you get one really cheap they're okay um if i could choose to have a a first chassis it wouldn't be a d4 it would always be an RMX for me, um, or a YD2, but I prefer the RMX as a as a beginner chassis. Um, I think the yeah, same. It's a it it, it, it tends to go just uh, be a bit more of a smooth entry, I think, to the hobby for people. I think uh, the only reason you would get a Sakura D D4, um, definitely not the D3. That one's no, way too old. It's um, completely out of date. Exactly, but. If, if you were to get one, it, the only reason to do it is because your local hobby shops have a lot of stuff in stock for it. Yeah. Um, there's people around you who have experience and maybe Yokomo or MST is not as readily available. Yeah. Um, I think that would be one of the only reasons to go with the Sakura. I mean, it is slightly cheaper, but it's like in the long run, it really isn't. Um, I think in the beginning, you're going to save less than 100 euros, which might seem like a lot, but um ask anyone who's doing this hobby you'll end up spending a lot more most likely yeah and and the i think the the thing that when people are starting out they don't really think about is if you start out on the wrong path when you change you almost start again um so whatever money you think you're saving you're going to spend that money on top of what you could have bought originally anyway so if you went and started out with an old touring car you're probably going to and you get into the hobby you're probably going to go and buy an rmx anyway 
and then you're left with a touring car that you can't sell because it's an old touring car and they're not worth any money. Um, and you probably hacked it up as well. Yeah, and it's it and yeah, you've you've not left it in touring car standards. Um, so I think that's the the big thing to remember is it might seem like you're going to spend more initially, but you'll end up with something that you're far more likely to be happy with and will do the job and also will last you. If you start out with an RMX or a YD2, you can go in into a world championships uh, if we get another one. Um, or you can go in into any competition that's local to you or you can um, just go and have fun in the street. Like it will do everything you need it to. It's, n it's not like they're too fancy to go and rip around a car park and have some fun. Um, but then if you get into it, you can buy some upgrades and tune it as much as any other chassis on the market. And the the knowledge base for them is huge. You know, you can ask almost anyone in the RC drift scene about settings for a YD2 or a RMX, and they'll give you some good, solid advice if they've got any experience themselves. You know, even if they don't run a YD2, well, settings for an RMX will kind of work on a YD2. Um, and but when you go down to touring cars or you know TTO1s or any of the the sort of non-drift options you get the settings probably won't work and you also probably won't be able to apply them on a lot of them they won't be able to accept that 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 higher level of camber or caster or whatever it is so you're you're sort of stuck in the middle on your own yeah exactly and what what might also be a good thing is that it's a lot similar to other people's drift chassis so if you get any of the ones we mentioned um probably a lot of local people around you will have the same or even if you start out with a group of friends and you're all new um, at least you can all get the same because if you all get a different touring car, then you all go a different path in yeah. uh, setting it up, getting it to work. Uh, while if you all get a YD2, Yokomo YD2 or an MST RMX uh, or anything else, even even a three racing, um, at least you'll all have a sort of similar path. You can help each other learn. You can help each other tune. Um, you can try out different things. Um, and then... Uh, that's probably going to be a lot more fun because you'll be able to tend them. and uh, Yeah, and also yeah. Um, maybe one of the things that you might not think about initially as well is if you are if you get a chassis that is uh, in use at your local track or your buddies that you're drifting in a car park with or whatever all have the same thing, you can borrow parts if you break something um, and you can have the knowledge from somebody who also has that chassis on how to best change that part so you minimize downtime. You know, if you break a belt or a gear or something like that, there's quick ways to change them often on a, on a lot of chassis. And if you end up um, on your own, you'll strip the chassis down trying to work out how to do something, and all you're doing is losing laps that you could also be having fun with your friends. Um, also, you can you can share parts, you know. Beginners crash a lot, um, <laughs> and you might break a lower arm. You might break something. Well, if your buddy has a spare, you can borrow that. If your buddy doesn't have a spare, you can't borrow it. So um, <laughs> it's j just those little things to consider. I mean, when when I started, I started with a buddy on my mat, and he had a, uh, a shaft drive um, MR4, which was the same, essentially the same touring car that I had, but I had the belt drive version. And almost nothing was shared between the two chassis because he had the shaft drive, so it had a completely different drive line. Um, and is he ended up buying a drift conversion chassis so he used drift wipers on the front well i was left with none of that and i had to work it out for myself and when my parts broke he didn't have any spares but he had loads of spares for his chassis um and then we yeah we both switched to the ibs because it was the easy route and then life got a lot easier yeah definitely and i think that's that's the main thing just ask around see what people around you have um and go for that so even if you maybe fancy the MST RMX a little bit more, but all of your friends have a YD2, a Yokomo YD2, I would say go for the YD2 anyway, um, because yeah, it's easier to share bits, it's easier to share knowledge. Uh, you'll be having pretty similar driving styles most likely, so it's much easier to get around the track together, uh, which makes the most fun. So uh, Buddy Bob in chat has asked, um, how do you convince people to go for a better option instead of buying, say, a TTO1? Uh, he's saying that people ignore the advice and they go for a TTO one instead. Um, the way I would normally do that in your position, Bob, uh, Bob's a pretty high level driver. Um, I would let them drive your car. That's normally the way I've done it in the past. Um, they'll maybe have driven a, a TTO one or something similar. Uh, if you let them drive your car, that's well set up. 
for the surface it's on. Um, you know, don't don't go to a track you've never been for and let them do the first laps there. Make sure the car runs nicely so you can give them a solid impression of what it's about. And just let them try the car and then explain explain the difference between a TTO one. You know, you can run through and say, well, a TTO one, you can't change camber or caster to this level, or I think you can't change caster at all on a TTO one, if I remember right. Um, and the gearing and the um just the steering lock and all of these things you can demonstrate how much easier it is to get to the level that you're at when you use the correct gear. Um, it's it's pretty easy on, with a TTO1 to be missold by your local hobby shop, like we say, because there, there's the TTO1 Drift Edition um, or Drift version, I can't remember what they actually call it. And it comes with a cool body and it's from Tamiya, which is a hugely reputable brand. And if you've done any form of RC, you know that they're solid kits and they're easy builds and all of that stuff. Well, I think when you can just demonstrate the difference between what you've got and also how quick and easy yours is to work on um, and the wealth of option parts that are available and the fact that, you know, uh, a YD2, which I, I think you're using at the minute. I know you're on a, I forget what you're driving anyway, but um, it, they're used in the world championships, but also, look, you can get one for 200 euros. You know, they're, they're a, a good entry that can take you all the way. Um, and the fact that a TTO one, it has been used in the World Championships, but it's never placed well in the World Championships, I don't think. Um, not that I'm aware of, anyway. I, I don't even think I've seen one. I've I, seen a TA03, but that's I, pretty much it. I remember there was, I want to say, a Swedish guy. I want to say it's Frederick a few years ago. Um, Frederick Neptune. I might be wrong. Uh, so <laughs> sorry, dude, if, if that's the case. But somebody turned up with the noisiest car I've ever heard, and it was a, I'm pretty sure it was a TTO one. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I well, could one, be wrong. One could be wrong. maybe, but that's out of a field of 150 drivers. So every year for uh, however many years there was, um, yeah. So there's not not been many. And he, I don't. I'm pretty sure that guy didn't come back with that chassis. He came back with something else the next year. I, I mean, exactly. I mean, because he was at that track, he got the chance to drive all of the different drift specific chassis. Yeah, and probably was sold on one of them immediately. Yes, so. and probably ended up going home with one. I think. Um, yeah, that's uh, a good we, thing if the shops are there. Got another question from Dimitri um, about the R31 GRK Global Standard 2. Um, he thinks it's a good choice for beginners, but what do we think about it? Uh, I think that's a good choice if parts availability is is easy for you. Um, in, yeah. in Europe, for the most part, there's not many of them at all. There's not many shops, if any, that sell the parts. So if you break something, you have to import it from Asia. Um, and that is a big enough hurdle that I think beginners shouldn't look at it um if you have a local hobby shop or, or or you know even a an online shop that you can get stuff to uh to you easily ideally from within your own country i think it's a great choice um it's a really good option but i think for for me i even having i've got one one of the i've got grk two and um even getting parts for that has you know sometimes it's a month wait and that was one of the problems i had when i when i started out with the uh the ib and with the touring car at the time, in fact, it's the reason I got into selling RC parts for a living was because mm -hmm. I would buy parts and they would take maybe a month, maybe f three to six weeks to turn up. Um, and if I broke a part, that was three to six weeks of no drifting. And then also unpredictable costs because you're probably going to pay some import duty and sometimes really expensive shipping fees. You know, There was many times when I only needed a couple of belts for my chassis but I had to buy other stuff or the shipping fee was so ridiculous that it made the belts 10 times their price. Um, and so you ended up buying a servo or something else to just make it worth having. Um, so then you end up spending more money than you planned to. So yeah, I think uh, in terms of chassis design, it's a good option in terms of availability, not so much. I think it might be a nice second car. Yeah. Like uh, like if, if you want to try something different, you want to have an extra car, then definitely get one of those because it is quite different from the RMX or YD2. Uh, simply being a shaft drive and having a different layout and it, it even looks completely different. Um, but indeed, parts availability has been tricky. I, I also have one. I, uh, I have a Global, the GRK Global, uh, with some GRK3 parts on them. But to get them here, uh, two, three weeks at least, um, and even ordering them is tricky because there aren't really that many shops. So I had to get them from R31 house directly, yeah. which was a couple of days of chatting back and forth because of the time difference before I actually even could place the order. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the best, but it's, it's a good chassis, but yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and if anyone's, you know, saying like, oh, to me, yeah, it's the best brand and you get it everywhere. Um, I think you could remind them that Yokomo as well, they have been around for many years. They've yeah. had uh, chassis in every discipline of RC with good success, with easy to build kits, yeah. uh, good parts availability. So um, I think they're uh, they're pretty close to Tamiya in that respect. So um, that's always a good option too. Yeah, and I think um, I think like I say, being able to to demonstrate what your uh, what your car can do is definitely the easy way of doing it. Normally, the amount of times over the years that I've had somebody come in and you know they're they've bought like uh what's the name of them like a maverick strada or one of those type chassis or an ftx banzai was that the other one um Could be, yeah there's, there's been loads they yeah. were so popular in the uk because every single hobby shop had them in stock as the as your drift option you know that was the way you you would get into it because and so we used to have people come to the track all the time and they would struggle 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 for a day you know, half a day to a full day, and they're not really enjoying it. And they're seeing everyone else having a blast. You can hand them a transmitter to a half decent car, not necessarily a full pro spec car, um, but just even an entry level RTR or something like that. And they're sold instantly because it just works for them. You know, there's no problems yeah. in just getting it running and just going and having fun. And, uh, you know, a lot of this hobby is about learning the tuning stuff and buying upgrades and all that kind of stuff. But like I say, there's nothing to stop you doing that with a better starting point. Um, yeah, and also, also it, with RC in general, the, the point you make about starting off with something that your local hobby shop sold you and then you're getting stuck and frustrated. Yeah. I think that has cost quite a few people to join this hobby. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I, I know from having done plenty of demonstrations and events that people come to me and they, they go like, oh, I have this car, but it's not working. And they're ready to give up on the hobby um they they go into it with a lot of enthusiasm they get stuck they get frustrated they put it aside and they go play video games on the playstation instead because yeah. it's easier or they um, get rid of the drift car and go crawling or go and buy no. a buggy or something and um they just they never they never get that moment that they get hooked on because there's been a barrier in their way yeah but uh moving on to uh, maybe another topic if yep. you actually have a car where do you go drive it? Yes. Because that has been that has been a big question as well. Um, and I think you and I both started out when there weren't any permanent tracks available. Um, well, actually, I started in a bit of an unusual position because I started by building a track. Uh, <laughs> so my first track was at Driftworks, and that was the reason I got into the hobby because I helped build the track because it looked really fun. Um, but most people will start drifting in their streets or in a car park or um i think that's uh the normal route um i i mean i actually ended up having the driftworks track then we rebuilt it and having a better version of the driftworks track and then we had six months to a year with no track and i did all the car park drifting i possibly could um actually we drive quite reasonable distances to go to a car park where we knew other people were going to be <laughs> so we used to go down to uh well, shout out to Car and those guys. We used to go to a meet called Skidworks, which was down in, I want to say Hemel Hempstead. I can't remember where it was in the UK, but it was maybe an hour or an hour and a half drive for me. And we'd go down there sometimes. And we'd also go to the Milton Keynes as the car park when they were cool with us running there and things like that. And I had so much fun because you're just having fun with friends. This, that's all you're doing. Yeah, I no, think I started no out with the same things. Like we used to do meetings in the big, uh, the big, um, parking garages, like the multi-story ones, yeah. and then just find an empty, empty spot. Yeah, Usually empty like corner. top floor or something is, is pretty empty because people don't want to walk that far back down to their car. Yeah. And um, you're not, you're not so, going when the place is busy. So exactly. Bring a broom, bring yeah. some cones and some discs and whatever, and, and build yourself a track. I think we, we started out doing it with chalk, yeah. just exactly drawing a, a layout on the uh, floor. We, we also got hold of some fire hose, if I remember right some old fire hose and um yeah, yeah we also had a garden hose at some point to uh yeah. to lay out part of the track at least or just That's some Stevenish, there we go. And, those guys corrected yeah. me but um <laughs> yeah it's i i think that's a really good way to start um my best advice would actually be just get to a track if there's a if you can find a local track just go to it um yeah. if it, it's not that likely to be a permanent track these days in a lot of places 
Um, if you're lucky enough to have a permanent track, then that's wicked because you can go whenever you need to. Um, but most tracks are pop-up tracks that will appear once a week, once a month, whatever it is. Um, and again, you'll find them in most Facebook groups or, you know, you'll you'll get chatting to people on Facebook that are not that far from you. And then you find out that you've got a couple of options to go to. Um, if, that, even if they are far from you, just ask where they get their information if there's any like international hangouts because yeah. a lot of people will be on an international group on Facebook or a forum even if they yeah. still exist. Um, and, it, and even if you are unlucky enough not to have a track that's reasonable distance, I would still go there early on. I'd, I'd go to your nearest track. You know, Even if it's a few hours drive, I would make the journey because you'll learn more in one day on a track with experienced drivers than you will in a year on your own. Um, definitely and also if you're practicing on a car park uh, if you really don't have a choice uh, just definitely do that because the more you drive the more you're going to learn um, just build a track just grab some random things to drive around set up maybe a wall with some pieces of wood or whatever so yeah. you can sort of practice your skills and be a bit more precise than just smashing yeah, a car around a I think... massive empty parking lot I think, uh, and the reason we say that, by the way, is not that there's anything wrong with just smashing your car around an empty uh, car park. It's that if you're having that, fun, it's all good. But... The fun wears off pretty fast if you're if you're doing that. the The fun in the RC drifting hobby is, for me, mostly about skill progression, um, leveling up, and b attempting to do things and struggling, then finding out how to make it happen, then being able to do it sometimes, then more often, then every time you try it, and the the ultimate goal with RC drifting is to be able to run a consistent lap. You know, do the same lap over and over because it's very very hard, and there's not many drivers that can do it at all. And I mean, I would say less than one percent of drivers can do the same lap every time. Um, even on a high even on a high skill level, um, absolutely. You, you know, you in, see it with qualifying in competitions. I mean, it's all about doing a consistent good lap. Yeah. Um, which is very difficult because no, pretty much no one gets a perfect score. No, it's it's Especially almost not it's almost row. never it's almost never that somebody gets a perfect score. But even you know you can watch people in qualifying practice, and they're pretty good. And then you watch them when it comes to it, and they they might get a half decent score, but they didn't do as well as they or they might not have done as well as they did in practice, or the other way around. They were rubbish in practice, and then they nail it for the the qualifying run. Um, and I think. Uh, yeah, for me, it's it's skill progression, and uh, for me, it's learning. So I love to learn about tuning things and new products and testing products to see how they make a change on the chassis. But that's if you're just smashing around a car park, you can't really do that. If you set up a course on a car park, you can have wicked fun, um, and it's still the same sort of fun as just smashing around. And then when you when that starts to get a little bit boring, then you maybe try and put some clipping points down on the track and try and hit those clipping points consistently and then try and hit them and be smoother and then try and hit them and be smoother and faster. And, you know, you can sort of gradually progress and then, you know, you introduce a friend and you've got tandem drifting and then you, the beauty with driving with somebody else is it never gets boring because you're always re reacting to what they're doing. And like I say, not many people will do the same lap over and over again. So every lap is a, is a new journey is a new adventure uh, basically you can you can mm. follow somebody and when you both start getting pretty good then you just turn up the skill level you know you go harder and faster or more aggressive or smoother or whatever it is you're chasing for or scale realism and go for more body roll and things like that um but if you can get yourself to any track you're gonna have a lot a lot faster progression and it's not that you'll, I don't think you miss out on anything because you can still have the fun. And you can also go to a track and also go to a car park or, you know, skate park or whatever it is you, you've got a flat open ground to, to drift on. Um, I think you, a lot of us still do, even if we're uh, on pretty high level of driving. Yeah. Well, and, uh, I, mean, especially I, I know at the plenty moment. of people who have a second car and they just go drive somewhere just yeah. for fun. For, for me, it's something I'm planning to do this summer get out and do some, some outdoor drifting because the, for me, I'm I'm a bit bored of carpet, and I want to I want to run on hard surfaces, and I don't have many options. Um, uh, although I did learn about a new one that's coming soon, and uh, slide house is going resin, which is good. So I have another option there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think definitely for me, the, the 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 beauty of going to a car park is also that it's a wide open space. You're not going to crash. The 
scary thing i think for a lot of guys that are thinking about going to a track is that they're the new guy they're the beginner they don't really know how to drive maybe they struggle to even do a donut or whatever it is with their, their car and they're worried about putting their car on the track with you know high level drivers with expensive gear but what you always have to remember is you're not the first beginner those high level drivers have seen they will probably be super excited to have somebody else that wants to drive at their track because it's another guy to drive with it's another guy to keep keep the place open and pay the bills and you know pay the track membership or track fees or whatever um and it doesn't take long of working with someone who's more advanced than you to level up uh, it doesn't matter how high your skill levels are if you can drive with somebody who's better than you you will get better uh and it's definitely i think that the ideal situation is when you get yourself to a track and you get some guys there that are very experienced they've got a lot of knowledge to share but they also understand that you just need to go and drive and they're not hounding you or uh, banging on about something you should change on your car or something like that the the, the first sort of probably 50 hours of drifting that anyone needs to do are just put the car down and drive just see what the car does when you make an input or when you you know when you get too close to the wall what happens these sorts of things you've got to work it out for yourself and you've got to have that sort of muscle memory begin to be imprinted in you um there's some definite tips that everyone can go into that with um one of the biggest tips i'd give anyone who's starting out is be smooth with your inputs you know if you're pulling the trigger and flipping it constantly then all you're doing is every time you do it the car is unsettling because it's accelerating lifting accelerating lifting and what you actually need is the car to be smooth and predictable and if you want to use a big input to unsettle the car that's great because that's your choice but you only do that when you want to unsettle the car whether that's on an initiation or slowing down or whatever it is um, and the same with the steering you should roll the steering on roll the steering off and ideally you want to enter the corner on the lock that you need for that corner you don't want to enter and work it out as you're as you're getting into the corner but when you start you will definitely do that because you haven't learned the muscle memory of what your car needs you don't know how far to turn until you've turned too much or not enough and then made a correction so that's yeah. that's like i say that i also think that if you're going to a track and you're scared that you are the new guy and maybe are in the way uh blocking other people and stuff on the track uh definitely introduce yourself to everyone else yeah. on the track so yeah. if you come in even if you're scared to talk to a bunch of strangers i mean uh it's rc usually is kind of an introvert hobby anyway um just introduce yourself to the guy who's sitting next to you in the pit just one guy um doesn't matter who it is and just ask the questions uh maybe they want to help you out tell your story uh ask maybe what the track etiquette is yep. like uh what do you do like am i which, allowed to drive all the time uh, and which tires and that kind of thing also that's a that's a rig exactly. deal if, if you didn't already know um most tracks have a tire that you must use um there's no discussion you just use that tire and it's generally to protect the track um but yeah i mean most tracks are just open you turn up and you drive when you want to drive uh for the day you know whether it's a, a morning or an afternoon or a full day or an evening or whatever it is and you pay your fee normally when you arrive um and you should ask the guy in charge of you know is it an open session can i just run because maybe they have a i've been to a few sessions in the past where they have like a beginner morning or something like that and it's expected that if you're a beginner you can run till one o'clock or whatever and then the track's only open for, for pros it's not very common it's almost never these days it's a bit of an old way of thinking but um it's good to make sure you know um i think also there's some golden rules that actually there's a lot of advanced drivers also need to remember and that is you never put your car down on a straight um <laughs> or any fast part of the track you put your car down out of the way so you enter the track where you are not going to block someone and that goes for the physical car on the track blocking a car uh, that might be coming around the track and it also goes for the driver's view the amount that's of times maybe, even now maybe that's the most annoying yeah the, if people are walking right in know, front of your face i'll and... be at a track with a guy that i've been drifting with for five years and he'll just either go walk in front of you and block your view or just lean down and he's blocking the view of six guys down the fastest part of the track or something like that <laughs> um, because it's just a lack of consideration for other people you have to remember that the track is there but also there's all the people watching the track that need to see the track to be able to control their car um that's really important and yeah and a, pi a pile up at the end of the straight might be quite an expensive crash yeah and um, it's you... it's it's also not the best introduction if, you, if it's your first day on definitely a, on i mean track. it's it's one thing to consider that 
crashes happen. Um, so if you are new at the track and people crash into you or you crash into other people, um, it can happen and it's a risk. Uh, everyone knows that. But be polite about it. Uh, apologize if you yeah. crash into someone. Ask if everything's okay. Um, usually people are, you know, they're fine if something breaks. No, nobody really gets angry or, or I think, whatever. I think the, um, the sort of golden rule is if you make a mistake, you apologize. And it doesn't need to be, exactly. you know, a formal apology. It's just you shout out, sorry, or my fault, or whatever it is. Because yeah. it normally will alleviate any annoyance that was there. You know, people will, will, will calm down because they realize it was a mistake and you didn't do it on purpose. Um, yeah. But the, 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 to flip that around, when you're, when you're new, you often feel like you're in the way of other drivers. You have to just remember that experienced drivers will either drive around you or they'll back off and give you space if the track doesn't suit that. Um, they can see that you're going to be in their way um, and they ju they'll just give you space because it's no fun for you and it's no fun for them if you guys are tangling all the time. So generally yeah, so what you'll do is you'll, you'll just pull over on a, on a quiet part of the track. You'll pull out of the way and wait for the, the new guy to, you know, get most of the way around a lap. So you're in front of him and then you can drift smoothly. And when you catch him up, you pull over and have a little rest because actually that's what most people do anyway. They do, uh, you know, anywhere from five to 50 laps and then they take a break. Yeah. And take so whatever you do, don't do anything unpredictable because that that makes things worse. Yeah. And um, if you panic when somebody comes up behind you and suddenly yank off to one side, you might put your car in exactly the spot they were planning to go around you. Yeah, exactly. So just, just be chill. Just keep driving as you were before. Um, usually when there's new people, uh, everyone else will be watching your car anyway um, because you're new, not because you're messing up, but because you're new. They're like, hey, who is this guy? How is he driving? What's going on? Uh, what's his speed? Uh, yeah. And then they'll be able to judge where you're going anyway, because they sort of figure out what your line is, what your speed yeah. is. Um, so if you do anything unpredictable, then all of that goes out of the window. So just uh, just stay calm and just keep driving. Um, and, and a, you're and a you're quick all there note, together anyway. A quick note as well is if you damage the track, you know, if you bang into a, uh, a track divider or a marker or something and you move it, then what you should do is find a safe place to stop your car and go and fix it again without walking in front of the view of people maybe just shout that you're going on track um just to announce to people so they don't get surprised because you have to remember when somebody is driving if this is the track and they're looking over here they can't see what's happening down this end um so you will be out of their view they'll come bumming down the straight at full speed and then they're surprised by a bloke standing in the, the uh the middle of the track and maybe they crash their car trying to avoid hitting you or whatever but it's good etiquette to fix your mistakes on track, you know. And if your car gets stuck on track, it's okay to ask for somebody to give you a nudge. Um, and if somebody asks for a nudge, you should give them a gentle nudge. You shouldn't smash into them. It generally, <laughs> just, you just need to drive up to the car slowly and let it bump and it will knock them free. Um, yeah, most, most body shells can handle that anyway. That's what they're made for. Yeah. Uh, just give them a little tap. Maybe, uh, maybe try to avoid hitting someone on the wheels because then you're directly hitting the chassis. Yeah. Just give them a, give them a nudge on the bumper or, or just ask like, which side yeah like, if they ask you like hey can you give me a little push you just like go like, yeah yeah which way um, yeah which way around and it, a, um, a, a kind of a, a tip that i'll give anyone that's driving on carpet tracks rather than concrete or any hard surfaces in particular it applies to everything but mostly uh carpet is if your car gets uh beached on a curb or something like that don't just pull the throttle hoping you'll get free <laughs> if, if you pull the throttle and nothing happens just stop it's not going to go anywhere so all you're going to do is you're going to spin your tires and maybe melt the carpet and damage the carpet or melt the curb or melt or damage your tire on the curb that then lead, leads to or leads to damage on the track as you're driving yeah. around. Um, it's okay with making people stop. It's not a problem. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Uh, and at the same time as if you have a mechanical problem or an electro electronic problem and your car stops on the track, you must shout that your car has stopped on track. Like I say, people won't be able to see it out of the corner of their eye. So you, the, the common one in the UK is to shout dead stick or there's a car on the straight <laughs> or something like that. And people will realize and they'll back off and maybe stop driving and look and come and help you or tell you it's okay to go on the track to get your car or whatever. But they're really important yeah, because if you don't do that, you just end up with... The embarrassment of having to go on the car to get your track anyway but then you've got the added embarrassment of uh somebody smashed into your car <laughs> and maybe damaged your car maybe damaged their car so it's it's better for everyone if you just shout dead stick or car on straight or whatever it is yeah here here it's common to just shout whichever corner or part of the track you're on yeah so especially end of the straight where everyone's 
as like that's the fastest bit of the track um just shout end of the straight and then people will look there and they know something's going on that they it doesn't even matter if it's a barrier that's loose or a car that's on the track that's or a, yeah whatever good, else it is just uh, a good point added uh, in chat by golden jesus good name um he said <laughs> and if you crash and someone's coming up on you just stay still that's the best yeah. thing you can do don't try and move your car out of the way because they will live unless it's at the end of the straight where they didn't see you where you should be shouting this car and then they'll back off and stop um if you're mid corner and somebody is following you and you've crashed or spun or whatever just stay still they'll see you and go around you or again you should shout that you've crashed or something like that if you can't move um but yeah. uh yeah that that just means that people can just make a choice to go around you rather than planning to go around you and then you move into their path maybe uh maybe one thing that comes up often as well if if you figure out what car you need is what kind of electrics do you need hmm. um this is th i think this is like usually question number two like okay i know which chassis i want and unless you get an, an rtr like a ready to run kit you're going to need to buy electrics yeah. um so that's a radio a speed controller servo motor uh batteries charger and probably um, gyro yeah right now yes um that's that's a whole different question all wheel drive or rear wheel drive but i think at the moment the best thing to do is just to start rear wheel drive yeah because that's what that's what's available right now like counter steer four wheel drive um i don't think anyone is developing any parts or chassis for it anymore no there's probably some stuff still available and also you're probably going to limit yourself somewhere down the line whether it's entering competitions where you know the all-wheel drive class is generally being dropped by most places um also some tracks are banning all-wheel drive it's not common but it does happen which means you might drive to a track and then be told you can't use your car um and also to be honest it's a bit slower and easier to get used to you know with four-wheel drive you you've got more speed and your skill level needs to be higher to to make it work um or make it work well i should say but Rear wheel drive is is the future essentially. So if you start with all wheel drive, you're just going to end up changing and probably need to buy another chassis. Um, yes, unless there are everyone else on the track, unless everyone else on the track is driving CS still. Or yeah, which drive. is is not common. Um, so it, I would definitely go to that track and see that before you made the choice. Um, yeah. Don't make any assumptions. You know, it, it, the last time I saw, I think the people that I could name on tracks in the uk that i've seen running four wheel drive are probably three guys and it's like their third chassis and they're doing it as a bit of a revival to try it out um a couple of friends that i've got of running their the cs cars again it's really rare it's not common just don't bother just go straight to rear wheel drive at this point um i'd love yeah. to see four wheel drive come back but it's not going to happen any any short time and to be honest the only people that i think are going to do it are the guys that used to run it and it might come back as sort of a, a retro class at some point, I think. <laughs> um, it's not coming back as the main thing ever, I don't think. No, it's it's not needed anymore. I mean, uh, we have all the stuff available to do rear wheel drive properly. Um, all the, or most of the ready to run kits you buy now will be uh, rear wheel drive, yeah. or at least they will be soon. Or, um, or at least yeah. if you buy them from a proper drift place, they will be. Um, if, you exactly. buy, not... if you buy almost anything from a general hobby shop, it's going to be four wheel drive. Um, and yeah. not what you need yeah just don't <laughs> yeah yeah for sure but yeah in for electrics um what would you recommend like where where would you go what what to spend on and what don't because i think most beginners will try to save a bit of cash anyway i mean there are some that just want the best stuff that's out there and just yeah copy we, we, we'll ignore those for track. now because that involves spending an awful lot of money and that's generally not what exactly. beginners should do until you know you're into the hobby and you know you can afford it um i i would actually recommend that somebody got into the hobby with a mst uh, uh, rmx 2.0 rtr kit um they're absolutely great chassis that come with really good settings out of the box they come with everything you need apart from a battery and charger the own it's got two weak points as far as i'm concerned one is that it doesn't come with turnbuckle sets um so you can't make adjustments but it's a very cheap upgrade when you know you need it when you know when you're into the hobby enough the bonus of going down that route is the settings are good. You don't need to worry about them being a little bit misaligned. Um, and it means when you bump a curb or when you uh, crash on track or something like that, your settings haven't been knocked out of alignment. It's a plastic uh, bar instead. And if you break it, you break it. 
Um, but it's one of the first upgrades I'd definitely buy for the chassis is the turnbuckle set, which is like, I think it's 15 or 20 euros. I don't think it's very expensive. The The main weak point of the RTR is that it comes with a cheap servo, which actually works fine, um, but it won't take too many big crashes. But they are very cheap to replace. I think they're like 10 euros or something like that. But you shouldn't replace it. You should upgrade it to a better option. Um, there are plenty of decent low profile cheap servos um I, so many i couldn't even name it but as long as ideally it's got metal gears um and it's not crazy slow then it will do the job um yeah. but and I it's compatible with your gyro because that's that's a big thing too yeah so one problem you often have with the slightly cheap but still fast and metal gear servos is that they draw a lot of power um which might be an issue, especially if you're also on a cheaper uh, speed controller or if you have a lot of other stuff plugged in. Yeah. So I think, uh, for exa- sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, so I would say there's a couple of things that I would definitely spend a bit more on and other things that you can save on. Um, Cause what I tend to see is that people want the fancy controller because that's the thing you have in your hands. That's yeah. what you see other people using. You get a screen with a bunch of options. Um, but that's actually one of the last things I would buy in terms of the electronics, like uh, a simple, basic uh, uh, transmitter usually has all the options you need in the beginning. Yeah. Um, what I would spend on is indeed the servo, maybe the gyro, not especially like something in the middle. Yeah. Um, you don't need the most fancy gyro because there's going to be options on there that you will not understand and you will mess stuff up. Same goes with um, the transmitter as well. You'll end up getting lost exactly. with options and you'll have accidentally changed the setting by knocking a button without knowing you knocked that button and something suddenly doesn't work right. So yeah. simple is always better for those, I think. So I think the servo, because with rear wheel drive, you're steering a lot, your gyro is using your servo a lot. Uh, having a good servo is key. Um, And then I think a speed controller and motor are also not that important. Uh, The only thing I would really look for is that you have a speed controller that has enough uh, voltage and amperage to run your good servos and your gyro. Uh, But turbo timing, uh, boost timing, all of that stuff is really not necessary. That's just a quick way to damage gears and and things like that if you you don't have the advice or the, the assistance to get them set up well. Yeah, yeah, getting it set up well is is the difficult thing. Like if yeah. you have a lot of boost timing, you're going to lose grip, you're going to lose traction way too soon, yeah. um, which makes drifting difficult. It makes and you're probably going to make your motor run hot and the SE run hot, maybe damage them yeah. because you've you've just because the thing you you build as you progress with this hobby is you build throttle control. You know, you understand how much throttle to use and when to use that, and as you get more experience you change your gear ratios to suit your driving and the circuit and things like that and until you have that information you generally run too hard on the motor Um, and it doesn't necessarily even mean high rpm all the time it can just mean high load which means you can be using um you either have too much grip or not enough grip and you're using too many rpm or not enough rpm and you end up just getting the motor and esc really hot and when they get really hot they tend to fail after a while um, sometimes very quickly so it's always worth just taking it easy. But also, if you have a cheaper motor in ESC and that still happens, it's a much cheaper fix. To be perfectly yeah. honest, when you're starting out, the bigger concern I'd have with battery and uh, with a uh, ESC is what connectors are on it. You know, if you're if you're getting hold of some batteries, you just need it to plug in. Um, you can easily solder them, and a lot of people are comfortable soldering and things like that. But to be perfectly honest. You don't the the requirement you have from an ESC and a motor is so low to start with that as long as it's not super torquey, so every time you lift off it locks the wheels, um, that's kind of the only thing you got to watch out for, which you won't know until you run it. Um, you can that's which is why you should do your uh, research and get some good advice from people that have tried that motor because there's yeah. an awful lot of generic racing motors or just bashing motors that your local hobby shop will try and sell you that are so talky because they're designed to make something wheelie rather than um you know run smoothly and drifting drifting is all about smoothness everything you want a smooth servo you want a uh, a smooth motor smooth esc you want smooth dampers you know you want smooth inputs everything has to be smooth and yeah i would i would definitely recommend going brushless at least maybe that's a good thing to mention as well because I think everyone on the drift track will have brushless motors. Yeah, um, I, the, I think brushed is 
brushed is breaking a lot because yes. it has it has the magnets in it. Uh, it has the brushes with which give resistance. So you get a lot of motor break, which is something you don't necessarily want, uh, at least not all the time. And, and they also drift, require more maintenance. Yeah, um, which true. is is completely avoidable by using a brushless motor. And these days, brushless motor combos uh, with an ESC are so cheap to get hold of. Yeah. Um, they also and, have a have a cutoff for lipo batteries, yeah. which a lot of the brushed sets don't have. The very few that are available now, cheap, they do have a, a cutoff for lipo batteries, but what they also have is a very low amperage and voltage for servos and gyros. So they're not they're not great. They're really meant for an entry level, uh, cheap buggy or very cheap touring car hmm. just to have some fun. Um, they're definitely not fit for drifting. We've got a question in chat. Um, what what about KV for motors? Um, it's irrelevant, to be perfectly honest. Uh, if anything, you want low. Um, yeah. High-powered motors are never good for drifting um, in terms of when you get the high-powered touring car motors or buggy motors or something like that. A uh, high-level driver might be able to utilize them and do something with them, but a beginner should just stay clear of them because they're probably going to be too torquey. They're probably going to be too powerful. They're also going to drain your battery faster. So you might as well have a lower power motor. You know, I, I generally recommend everyone just gets a 10.5 motor, um, which is the, the 0.5 is uh, brushless. Um, that just means you can enter any competition in the world, as far as I'm aware, um, yeah. and you're not restricted by your motor. There's a, you know, if you were to go for an eight and a half, then you're probably going to have too much power than the, or more power than you need to start with. But you're also going to turn up to a lot of competitions, not all of them, but a lot of competitions and be told you can't enter. You need to go and buy a 10.5, which never means you spend more money again. Um, I would also say if you're starting out, you should probably keep in mind that you will probably replace your electrics if you get really into the hobby. Um, it's not to say you can't get away with lower, low end uh, or beginner level electronics, but you are going to probably replace something because you want something that it doesn't that your current setup doesn't offer you um yeah maybe uh, good to keep in mind also if you're talking about the motors uh what happens a lot and this is not for every single one of them but if you're searching any random hobby shop um if motors are um just mentioning the, the kilovolts the kvs usually they're sensorless motors um it's not always the case but usually they are yeah uh, censored motors often get um, get mentioned by the, the the amount of turns. So that's the ten point five we're talking about. So if you're if you're just seeing the kilovolts, uh, usually it's a sensorless set, and I wouldn't go for that either. No. Um, again, it's it's just not smooth enough for drifting. It works fine in a buggy, uh, but not not in a drift. Yeah, and, and then um, maybe one. Hmm? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say as well the the thing to remember with motors as well is if you go too powerful. Um, it puts more strain on the chassis. It puts more strain on the, the gearbox. It puts more strain on the pinion and spur gear. And if you're a beginner, you may not set your mesh perfectly on your pinion and spur. So you'll end up chewing through pinions and spurs until somebody shows you how to do it right. Because um, it's very much a, uh, a something that's done by feeling. So when somebody shows you how it should feel, you then can do it. It's easy. When you're just starting out, unless you've been doing touring cars or buggy racing or something else, um, a higher power motor is just going to kill more of your chassis faster. Um, and like I say, you also just don't want a motor that causes too much drag. Um, there are there are plenty of options out there. It changes all the time, especially at the budget end of things. Uh, there's always new options available. But again, if you ask in a Facebook group or something like that, you'll get feedback on a motor you're considering. You'll also get a lot of people just tell you to buy the expensive stuff, which there's a reason they're telling you to do that. And that's probably because they went down the route of buying one or two motors of a different option um, and then weren't happy until they bought the expensive stuff. But they may be at a track where they're being guided by people and they just got good settings applied to their ESC to work for that motor because the knowledge is there. Um, so it's not to say you shouldn't go and buy a nice motor, but you don't have to. Um, it's also, I'm not, it, it's a, a bit of a sort of odd way of looking at it as well, but a lot of the, the the way i look at it with beginners and electronics is it's good to have a goal to build up to the high level stuff you know if you're if you can go and enter a competition and enjoy yourself then maybe that's when you step up and buy fancier gear um you don't 
the, one of the worst things that happens with beginners is they go out and spend all of the money they can and buy the latest chassis, the latest transmitter, the latest motor, servo, gyro, whatever, and they spend a thousand euros, fifteen hundred euros, and then they put the car down and they still can't drive it. And that person is then they've invested so much money that the disappointment is higher because they tend you get a lot of guys that come into the hobby and they expect that buying the good stuff will make them better to start with but everybody starts at the same point and it's not until you're a little way down the path of learning that you actually can utilize any of the benefits from the the high-end stuff um yeah and yeah, that's lot- usually what you get with the high-end stuff it, it has an infinite amount of settings that will only really work if you know what you're doing yeah um, so you're going to need a lot of experience to set it up right and if you by accident change one setting and it makes it worse but you cannot find it anymore you're screwed um so i would yeah keeping it simple is definitely a good there's, thing to do when you're a beginner also a bit of a misleading thing that happens a lot of tracks which is where a beginner will drive an expert's car and find it much easier to drive than their own car and they think it's because that guy has spent all of the money and they forget that they've put in years of work to get their car perfect and they have the understanding of how to utilize their suspension properly and their steering properly and their motor properly and the gearing to get the traction and the gyro settings and the transmitter settings and you know there's thousands of hours been spent to get that car to that point maybe not with that chassis but in terms of years of knowledge and even if it's not that driver's own knowledge even if they've just taken settings from somebody else somebody has invested the time to get that car to drive amazingly so it's always worth remembering that you can buy the fancy gear but it doesn't doesn't put you to the same level as the guy with all the fancy gear you have to you have to earn that with your own efforts maybe one more thing to uh to mention is the batteries uh and i think this is a tip not just for beginners because often it's the last thing people spend money on or one of the first things they try to save money on because you can get a lot of cheap batteries you can get a lot of cheap chargers but simply because we're all using lipo batteries it's also quite dangerous to use the cheap stuff um i think especially the chargers if you if you get a crappy charger yeah you're risk you're risking a lot Um, and actually even crappy charge cables can cause a lot they, they can cause a lot of problems um but just to because this episode is kind of aimed at the beginner just to point out that lipo batteries are potentially very flammable um they if they if you look after them and treat them with respect they're safe and touch wood i've never had a a lipo problem um i've had lipos go bad and need replacing but i've never had a fire or anything like that but i know quite a few people now that have and when a lipo fire goes up there's kind of no putting it out until it's done um yeah uh, it's a, not, it's a not in any realistic fire, way so. anyway um not in any realistic way where you're at the side of the road because it's caught fire in the back of your car so a couple of really quick uh points that i'll run down uh, before we get on to selecting batteries is you must always use a lipo bag um and don't just buy the cheap silver lipo bag off of ebay or anyone like that they are crap and they will often be flammable themselves so um buy one from a reputable company you know they can cost they're normally between 10 and 30 euros or something like that um you should buy a half decent one because you will use it always if you're if you're not driving your car your batteries should be in your lipo bag whether they're in being stored in your pit bag or being driven to an event um or being charged they should always be in there and you should never ever ever leave your batteries in your car when you're not using it um i've had a couple of people that have had lipo fires while charging and i've also had a couple of customers that have had lipo fires while driving home from events so um you absolutely need to remember that it is a flammable thing and actually i remember being told by a battery manufacturer years ago that a 3s lipo we only use 2s lipos in drifting really um, but a 3s lipo has the same energy in it as a hand grenade so they are very potent uh potentially dangerous bits of kit um so yeah if you're not sure you should ask your local track owner or event organizer or something for advice but basically the long and short of it is if your car isn't on track the lipos must be in the lipo bag and don't pack it full with 20 batteries you know you get some big lipo bags and you could put a load of batteries in there but that just makes it less likely that that bag's going to deal with a fire because when one goes up they'll all go up um yeah. so generally i run three maximum and that's two car um lipos and one transmitter one 
Um, Same for me. I, I have one of those cloth ones with the Velcro. You can sort of yeah. wrap all the way around the batteries. Yeah. Um, and when you're packing them up, also make sure the connectors aren't exposed to each yeah. other. Yes. Um, so sort of put them in a way sort of like opposite or whatever yeah. so that the batteries uh, cannot touch each other on the terminals because that that's bad. <laughs> and there's, I mean, if, even if you don't believe it, just have a quick Google, find some videos oh, uh, yeah. of like, the there's... batteries going up. And it's it's scary. It really yeah. is scary. There's so many people in this hobby who have had their car burned down, their shed burned down, or even their entire house burned and, down. And there's been some very experienced people as well. Um, it's definitely it's something that can happen. It, you know, just because I've not had it happen to me yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I, I do my best and I follow all the precautions that that uh, that I can. But sometimes you're just unlucky. And uh, Again, one of the things I was told by a battery manufacturer is that a, uh, a LiPo fire can result from something that happened a week before. You know, it can be a very slow thing that causes it. And yeah. um, I think it happens a lot with buggy racing because of the jumps as well, where they're getting shocked around, where later down the line, the battery has a problem. Um, but if you yeah. do something, if you make a mistake and you plug the battery in backwards and reverse the polarity, um, don't just assume you got away with it. You know, that battery might be damaged. It might have a problem. You might also end up with other problems later on because of charring in the terminals or something like that. Um, so I, if, if anyone does that, I kind of consider that battery bad. And maybe it doesn't need replacing immediately, but you should consider that, that battery will probably need replacing before the other one. Um, yeah, especially I, if, there starts, if they start swelling, if they start puffing. Um, I've seen people like trying to tape the case yes. back shut. Uh, definitely don't do that. No. I mean, a, I, a I battery get that puffs is an thing. unhealthy battery. Uh, if a battery is no. swelling at all, it's not happy. Um, and you'll exactly. see a lot of people running them. It's, I mean, this is this is where we say that some experts and advanced drivers will need to pay attention. The amount of people I see running a battery that is struggling to fit inside the battery holder because it's swollen up enough, um, that battery is dangerous. And if it was in my track, it'd be outside. I wouldn't allow it in. Um, and I've. I think people in chat that have been to my tracks in the past have seen me do that many times where I'd make people take their battery outside or put it in their car or go and dump it in a bucket of water because it's not safe. Yeah. But anyway, getting back to battery advice, like I say, you should run two cell LiPo. That's essentially the standard in RC drifting. There are people that run um, other battery technologies. They're not really worth running. They don't really, there's no benefit to doing it at all. And there's a lot of negatives. So you should just run a two cell LiPo and I would also add to that you should run a hard case lipo, not a soft case. So it must be in a plastic case. Um, you get a lot of the, the the soft case lipos for drone racing in the smaller sizes and things like that. But you also get a lot that are sold for general bashing and things like that. And the hard case lipo will just give it a bit more protection, um, particularly if it's near a belt or something in a chassis. You don't, you know, a soft case lipo is pretty easy to get some damage. And personally i would normally recommend beginners to get a um a battery with a, a dean's connector or something on that means you can't reverse the polarity because it makes life a lot easier but then that does mean as you advance you're almost certainly going to change uh, at least your connectors if not your batteries um yeah definitely and with the hard case batteries they also fit in your chassis better because most of the battery mounts they will be designed for um a very common size like a standardized size of batteries yeah which most of the hard case batteries are so if you're going to get one either it's a big one or what they call a shorty which is a bit smaller um they will most likely fit your chassis very nicely and snug but they're not bouncing around um you don't have to modify anything to make it work yeah it, it is also worth mentioning that you should if you can get the measurements of the battery and check it against your chassis or ask someone online if they could measure their battery tray because um, one of the things people tend to do when they're starting out is they get the biggest battery they can for the longest run time. So they'll end up with an 8,000 milliamp hour battery or something like that, which is great, but they're generally massive and they're too big for your, your standard battery tray. Whereas if you were to go for a 5,800 or a 6,000 maybe, um, it would probably fit fine. Um, it does vary massively by manufacturer, so you actually need to check it. You know, you can't just say all 6,000 milliamp hour batteries will fit. You need to measure them because also some have funny things about them, like really hard squared corners that actually make it harder to get them in and out of the battery tray and things like that. Um, or they have the uh, terminals, or the wires that come out of the end, which means then the battery tray can't close and things like that. So you have to just, it is a bit, 
harder to recommend because I think of all the batteries that are available in the market, maybe 5% I would consider good. Um, and I would consider maybe 10% okay. Um, and then I consider the rest to be junk. So it's very hard because uh, that that is sort of a, uh, an advanced driver who's tested a lot of batteries that has very specific requirements. But also there's an awful lot of batteries that are sold with something on the sticker that is not what you're buying. It's just a complete lie. You know, you, there's a lot of batteries that get sold as a 6,000 milliamp hour that are more like a 4,000 milliamp hour, or they have a high C rating, which is the amount of power that the, um, the, the uh, current that it can discharge, um, that is not what it can actually do, because almost nobody has access to technology to test them. So, and absolutely all of the batteries are made outside of Europe. And there's no sort of legal recourse or anything like that if somebody has missold something. So manufacturers just one up each other by putting new stickers on old products, and um, which it's a bit of a downer to say all of this. But it's it's also worth pointing out that if you buy the super cheap stuff, you're probably buying something that's absolutely terrible. If you buy the really expensive stuff, you're probably buying something that's not much better than your average, you know, the middle range stuff. So you should just go yeah. in, uh, you know, and again ask for opinions from people. Um, everyone generally with batteries unfortunately will tell you what they've got is great and you don't need anything more than that but batteries are one of those, th those things that you don't know that it can be better until you try something that's better you know it's like people with um with if you've never driven a ferrari you can't imagine how much better a ferrari is than driving a ford mondeo um <laughs> you, you've heard it's better but you don't know it's better um and it's it maybe not is isn't the best analogy, but it's one of those things that I see so many people with buying batteries that just aren't what they need at all. You know, they buy either they generally will buy whatever's cheap on sale somewhere, and that that's fine. But then they end up with these, like I say, wires that stick out the wrong way, um, and then it becomes a bit dangerous because they've got these wires dragging along the ground, or you know, jammed between a couple of bits of carbon or something like that. Um, or just batteries that seem good, but they swell up really quickly they, or they, they don't last very long yeah. but, you know they or even in terms of runtime they start out when they drive what, what happens with a lot of batteries is they drive fine for 10 minutes and then the power just drops off drops off drops off and lipo cut never hits because they're basically out of punch before you get anywhere near the end and when you're very first starting out that doesn't matter but when you're trying to keep up with people and that you know you've got a 50 minute runtime or something like that but you can only actually run for 20 minutes before you can't keep up with another guy it's just annoying and it can be easily avoided by spending the exact same amount of money on another battery um yeah. in terms of just in terms of brands that i like their batteries at the moment it's basically uh aramax which are at the higher end of price um they do have some cheaper batteries but everything i've tried from them has been good um and hasn't let me down and um they're not so easily available in Europe anymore, but for any American viewers, Thunder Power batteries are also pretty good. Um, and chargers. Um, Gen Z stuff is fine. Uh, it's completely average. I wouldn't say it's good, um, or at least I've never tried anything that has been good. Um, but they're not generally too disappointing. Um, and one very important thing is I would absolutely recommend that any beginner avoids a high voltage battery. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, you should just get yeah. a two cell 7.4 if you go to a 7.6 they're more highly stressed and more likely to have problems and actually if you go into cheaper electronics some won't take the extra voltage most will but some won't um so there's yeah i currently have uh, batteries from co yeah. um which is a brand you don't really see much in drifting but in in touring car and buggies it's or it was very common a little bit less now um but those batteries are very good um I, I don't think they're the best batteries, definitely not. But for a beginner or someone who's just having average use, uh, they're they're great. And they're about 30 to 40 euros each, um, depending on uh, which capacities and size and stuff you get. But um, don't, go, don't go for anything cheaper than that, because usually it's not No, worth it. I mean, uh, one of the comments in chat is the uh, Turnergy Nanotex, which I started with, actually. Um, Same. And... They are readily available, particularly from Hobby King, um, and they are completely fine. I wouldn't recommend them only because they're very hit and miss. Um, they seem to have good and bad batches. They will be fine. You might 
get a set that la you, I, I would recommend buying two batteries so you can charge one and run while that's charging and just swap them um but the problem i've had with nanotechs in the past i've seen many people that bought two batteries from the same shop on the same day one will have a 40 minute runtime one has a 15 minute runtime um, and i've seen that probably more than 100 times over the last 10 years um i've had it myself with some with, i think my second set that i bought back in like 2012 or something like that um and i think like i say they're okay and if you're willing to take the gamble because they're quite cheap then yeah they're, they're fine um but i couldn't stand I've, behind I've them had, and say yeah they're good i've had every single version of them uh, they've had over the past years and they're okay like you say um yeah. especially the newer ones they're they're a bit more consistent but what i found is that they swell quite quickly i was gonna say almost um, every single one of the new types that i've seen has been swollen particularly the yeah the graphene or whatever they call them um the yeah, gray, so they, the gray they work fine but i think they're just pushing the capacity a little bit for the casing and it just makes them swell a little bit yeah. too fast um they're still fine i i gave them away to someone who still runs them and they're they're fine um but they definitely lose their peak um they won't fit your chassis very well to me they're just a bit too sketchy so i i get rid of them yeah um, um and the, like i say the problem with batteries is it's really hard to recommend something in particular but just expect whatever you buy to maybe have to be replaced within a shorter amount of time than you ex than you would like um and with batteries and, and, and then if it doesn't nothing. you're you you're just pleasantly surprised um yeah i, I would say with batteries never ever go second hand oh no um, never there is there's so no with, such thing with, as a second hand battery to me there's a reason somebody is selling it generally so with um, everything we've mentioned before um chassis bodies tires electrics second hand is fine except for batteries yeah um it's the only thing you want to know a hundred percent certainty uh what happened to them how old they are how many times they've been driven uh what the condition has been uh throughout that time otherwise you know it, they're, they're cheap anyway um so well just don't one bother. one thing that probably sums it up pretty easily is almost all batteries are sold with zero warranty um yes and if they do have a warranty what you probably will find from almost every manufacturer is that if you try to put it in a claim they will just tell you that um it was user error it's caused by your charger or it's caused by a bad solder or something like that um or even by shipping yes um which that i'm sure there are manufacturers that will just replace the battery um but it's the one thing that even as somebody who's worked selling rc drift products for as long as i have i think only thunder power batteries were the only ones i've ever been happy to sell everything else i mean right now we actually don't sell any batteries at RC Boss. Um, we do have some listed on the website, um, but they are not something I would even recommend. They are something that we we can't find a manufacturer that we're happy with. Um, so it's one of those things that, like I say, it's tricky to sit here and not give solid advice on. Um, the only advice I could give you is talk to somebody that lives where you live, see what they've got, see how happy they are with them. Take a look at the batteries if they're swollen assume what they've just told you is no good um because it probably <laughs> yeah. means they're just okay with batteries being a bit crap um but like i say most people drive with dodgy batteries so you just have to take a plunge and hope you get something decent and maybe have to budget to replace it in a month or six months or a year or whatever it is that you get out of them um, but as soon as a battery starts as soon as the runtime on a battery drops down really low you know if you start with a battery that gives you 45 minutes runtime and you get down to 15 minutes that battery is not long for this world and is ready to go on fire. So stop using it. Um, it's not worth hassle. It's one thing to have a lipo fire and a lipo bag. It's another thing to have your car destroyed because it burns out on track or in the boot of your car when you're driving home. Um, and you also have to consider the other people. You know, if you've got a lipo fire that burns somebody's track and damages their income and their their business, then that's not good. If you have a lipo fire that injures somebody because it just explodes when it's sat on the table, um, well, that's no good. And all of these things are so easy to avoid by just assuming that batteries are dangerous and want to hurt you. <laughs> and so uh, when you're, if you're, if you don't treat them with respect, that's when you have problems. When you treat them with respect, yeah, yeah. you're prepared for the issues and everything is taken care of when it goes wrong. You cannot really be too careful. I mean, uh, just, just to give you an example, when I charge my batteries at home, they are on a hard surface, sort of on the kitchen counter or something like that, like a stone uh, surface that cannot burn. They are in their lipo bag with um, um, 
charger cables that I did not make myself, but they were from a manufacturer. They were Yokomo's, which I trust. They were quite expensive, but that is why I got them because they're actually good quality. Um, and then actually the, the, the charger and the batteries themselves, they're still in a metal tray as well. That's vented. So if anything goes wrong, um, yeah, I'm basically covered by three layers of protection. Yeah. And, and that's just for your regular charging of your batteries. And as, I, as I've mentioned before as well on, on previous episodes, I also highly recommend, based on advice from battery manufacturers, that you rest your batteries between charging and running. So when you come off the yeah. track, don't just plug another uh, plug the battery straight into a charger and put it on full whack. Give it five or ten minutes just sat in the LiPo bag. And then when you your battery's finished charging, don't put it, as soon as it beeps to say it's done, don't put it straight in the car and go and give it full power. Give it five or ten minutes. And as soon as you do that, your batteries will be a lot healthier for a lot longer. Um, it's also worth mentioning that poor solder connections between motor and ESC or battery and ESC will probably cause swelling and also cause things to run hotter than they need to run because of the the extra resistance that's caused so if you're not very good at soldering get somebody who is to do your soldering um yeah. if you have to if you can buy something that's pre-soldered then as a beginner that's great because that t- just takes out a whole mess of problems that you can run into um so yeah, definitely it's it's one of those things that the the more time i've done this hobby the more i see people having problems that is just caused by poor soldering and a, a a basic a basic way to look at soldering that's bad is if your solder connections aren't shiny, they're bad. Um, and the problem when it comes to RC soldering is there's a lot of guys that are very competent solderers when it comes to uh, model railways and things like that, where it's very low power, very low current, and basically anything will do. But they're very experienced. They've been doing it for 30 years. And they're very confident in their soldering. Those guys shouldn't solder your RC wires because they um, they don't know what it takes. They don't know the problems. Um, you want somebody that does RC racing or drifting or something like that to do it, or somebody who deals with high voltage and high current solders, uh, solder connections. Um, it's not something you really need to worry about right at the start, but you should keep it in mind. If you've never done soldering before, get somebody else to do it. Um, not only is it maybe going to cause you problems with your batteries, but you might end up frying something. It's very easy to put too much heat into an ESC um, and kill it before you've ever turned it on. Uh, I've seen it probably over 100 times now um, over the years. And if if you're spending everything you can um, to get into this hobby, you don't want to have to go out and buy another 50 to 100, 150 uh, euro ESC. It's easy, again, it's easily avoidable. Uh, learn from the mistakes plenty of other people have made in the past um but yeah uh, we've got another question in chat which is um what body shell would you recommend for a beginner i would say whatever whatever's cheap um your first body shell will probably not last you that long and your first body shell will probably get crashed around quite a lot and you, if you're new to drifting as well as rc drifting your new body shell or your first body shell will probably not be how you want it to look three months into your your hobby you probably will suddenly develop a new sense of style when it comes to cars and um and want something different so i would say just get something cheap assume it's going to get crashed around assume it's going to get beaten up a bit and then just expect to build another one at a later date i also would uh echo that with don't put hundreds of hours of work into your first body shell because the first time you crash it into a wall um you're probably <laughs> going to be pretty disappointed uh, but yeah, aim and... for that at a later date that's great but just maybe, maybe consider that uh you don't need that right away maybe also check one of our previous episodes to this uh, a little bit as well um i think our conclusion back then was also to get something that's one piece so don't get one with uh loose bumpers loose little details that you all have to paint and glue and so on get something that's uh, simple to build. So get something that has readily available uh, light buckets if you want lights, uh, something that has the spoiler and mirrors and things like that included because it will save you a bit of money and you will be sure that everything fits. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you're spending a lot of money, a lot of time in trying to make something look the way you want it. And like you say, uh, you'll probably crash it on the first time you're going to drive it. So. The, it's a bit of a the waste. only the only sort of safety thing you have to think about is make sure it fits. Um, there's a lot of chassis uh, bodies from companies like Tamiya, 
that um that are for a different size chassis than the 110 scale drift car so you generally want something that's around 257 to 259 millimeters in wheelbase then it'll probably fit um yeah i think i think getting something from yokomo for example would be a safe bet yeah they're they're plenty wide so most of the chassis will fit with yeah. any of the wheels you want um and indeed they have the light buckets they have the accessories everything they are and usually a one piece um and they're pretty cheap yeah. compared to some and, of the other and it's shows. another positive for going the mst rmx2 ready to run uh route because it includes a tamir body that is um designed to fit that chassis um so generally i'm pretty sure on 100 percent of all the mst rtr body options there is body host uh, body post holes to be drilled that are marked on the body that makes it really easy to get it aligned properly and a lot of bodies like the overdose bodies that are really nice they don't have any markings because it looks nicer to not have any any dimples or anything marked in the body but it means it's really easy especially when you're inexperienced to drill some holes where you don't want the holes to be um and also it means in, in reality you should probably or it also if you have to drill your own holes it also means you have to buy another tool because you shouldn't really use a drill to drill your holes in a body post uh, in a in a body shell yeah. you should use a body reamer which is a cheap tool but it's another thing you've got to buy um, whereas if you go down the rtr route um i can't i think the holes might still need drilling i can't remember but again if you go to a track there'll be somebody there that has a body reamer that you can borrow almost certainly um, yeah and if you have a body that has the dimples it's a great job yeah so they literally just have you to just, point at it and you just ch That's check it. the manual make sure that the body posts uh holes that or sorry the body post uh mounting holes that you're using are the right ones because on a front bumper on most chassis you've got two options for different bodies and some older chassis um they you know have extenders and things for the rear post to put them in line with your average you know to me a body post holes or whatever um so something to consider at least yeah and then get something that's easy to cut so uh yokomos to me as they all have pretty deep grooves uh, so you can score and uh, score and break or yeah. even have a line to follow when you're cutting it with uh with scissors um bodies like pandora's for example they have lines that are not always as defined yeah or um, maybe and also uh, maybe stop before they were expected um, exactly and, and also like we say they usually have a bunch of different parts that you have to glue on and have to cut 100 percent right otherwise it won't fit or it won't yeah. fit properly at least yeah, um, and, so yeah and, go and, for something simple you know it, it your first body doesn't have to be your favorite kind of car or a replica of your own car or anything like that it kind of generally what happens is people will get a body show and as soon as they start really enjoying the hobby, they start planning a new body show. And for some people, that's the first time they drive. For other people, that's a month down the line or three months down the line or something like that. Um, so just consider your first body to be sacrificial and something you will almost certainly outgrow very quickly. Um, yeah. You need to get some practice in to do it properly anyway. So Yeah. Um, unless unless you're super talented but most yeah and are. if you've got the experience of painting touring car bodies or something like that yes you might be able to make a nice body but also you will probably still have your eyes open to you or you'll see something at a track that you think that's a really cool body i didn't know they made a br324 or whatever it is um and admittedly that's not the easiest to come by body or something <laughs> i'd recommend but you know what i mean there are bodies out there that are um unknown outside of the, the drift world you know um, yeah. and also like i say a lot of people get into this hobby that aren't from a drifting background so they won't know a lot of the cars that are involved and somebody might see an s15 and think it's the coolest looking car ever or an fc or a 911 or whatever it is and that's what they want um so when you go to a track you often have your eyes open to things you just didn't know were there or were out there even yeah definitely lots of uh lots of information so far um yeah, I, think, I think we uh, can uh we could continue for another hour or so well, uh, I, I think the only thing to add um is you need to not be afraid to ask questions of experienced drivers um like i say this is this is one of the few hobbies where experienced drivers want beginner drivers to get involved you know if you're into golf a beginner is an annoyance if you're on a golf course they're just somebody taking up space um with the t-slots and um if you're into touring cars, beginners, uh, they get in the way, they cause crashes, they ruin somebody's race. Drifting's not like that at all. Drifting is about everybody getting better. Um, and the more people that are enjoying the hobby, the better it is for everybody. So yeah. as long as you're open-minded and happy to listen to advice that's given to you and don't just dismiss it because you think you know better, which 
if you're new to the hobby you don't know better um <laughs> almost almost every time there's the, the reason people especially if more than one person gives you the same piece of advice it's probably because that's a tried and tested piece of advice that applies to almost everybody um yeah and as you mentioned in the beginning drifting is still a relatively small sport most of the tracks they you know they could really use a couple extra people to uh make it easier on the cost and to yeah have a reason to stay open basically yeah Som um, sometimes the difference between yeah. a track staying open and a track closing is two drivers um in all yeah. honesty two drivers that go once or twice a week that makes a big difference to because no track almost no tracks are there for profit they're there purely to allow people to enjoy the hobby um and you know most people start a track because they need somewhere to drive um they're not doing it for glory or fame or money or any of these things they're doing it because they want to enjoy the hobby and that involves other people enjoying the hobby so they want you to have a good time so you keep coming back um so if something if you know if you, if you get a bad vibe from people maybe you know have a discussion with those guys and see what the deal is because it might be a misunderstanding it's almost never that they don't want you there um no. that's it's I, i'd say that's almost unheard of um and one yeah with uh, yeah, well i was sure. just going to move on one quick thing i'd also want to cover um which we've got down here as a question just uh running a bit long today but um is <laughs> should you enter a competition as a beginner and i would say definitely yes um same i would i would recommend entering a competition whenever you know whether it, whether that is within your first couple of weeks of drifting um you know we've got guys now that competed for the uk at the world championships that did their first competition at my track within a month of starting the rc drifting hobby um if you don't enjoy it i would try it again after a few months because it may be that you were just it, it didn't click with you because you were too early in, down the journey um i would definitely do a few few competitions before you decide you don't want to do any more because there are a lot of people that don't enjoy doing competitions and choose not to do them and that's completely fine uh, but there are an awful lot of people that the competitions are the driving force between them wanting to to improve and get better um and the yeah, reason think, they put in all the hours of practice. I think a couple of reasons to go is that it's very easy to learn for uh, a, a couple of different reasons. One, usually competitions attract a lot of drivers. So it's going to be a busy day. There's going to be a lot of people there with a lot of different cars. Um, and styles. Probably a few that will want to help you out. Um, so if, if you ever need advice, that's maybe the best day to go. Also, it means downtime for a lot of people because there are uh, scheduled sessions for practice and qualifying and so yeah. on so there will be moments where there's a lot of drivers just sitting in the pits waiting for the next session so yeah. that's the or, perfect or, opportunity or they got to knocked just... out of the competition and they're free to talk yeah yeah so that's the perfect opportunity to just check out their chassis have a talk give them your car uh, hear their opinion get some advice um, also because most of the competitions they have some sort of driver's briefing they have a a line out on the track with uh, clipping points or whatever yeah. um, that will tell you sort of what line to go for, what line to practice. Uh, and then indeed ask some questions like, hey, why are we going around the outside here while inside would be faster or something yeah. like that? Or, why, I'm sure, or why did that guy lose that run? You can also ask what's going on in the exactly, competition. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. so what, it's, what it's, is it that that guy did that I can't see that made him lose? Uh, because yeah, so it's a very big example. You of, otherwise wouldn't of what drifting is basically so yeah um yeah def uh, definitely compete and and just have the right expectations like if you're say, new you're not going to win uh, yeah. it's that simple you're you're there to learn and to have fun and to hang out with people to watch other drivers compete at a maybe higher level than yours so you have something to look at um uh, that's probably cool to see um, and also maybe yeah. remember that um competitions aren't the be all and end all and they aren't mm -hmm. for some people um but it also means you don't have to drive the way competitions are being driven unless you're in that competition. You know, competitions are run by judges who set out criteria and sometimes they set something out to be make uh, make it a challenge and it's not necessarily that doing what's happening in a competition is what you should be aiming for all of the time. It might be, for example, with the Worlds uh, in Holland last year that I judged, we set a line that was very challenging because we were aiming to slow cars down. Now, that's not a line I would run normally but when, you know, if I was just, if, if Taj and I were just drifting together, 
we're not going flat out trying to drive the car as fast as we possibly can and melting the tires and doing all of that but in a competition unless there is some restrictions put in place sometimes you have you just see awful drifting because people are trying to run away from each other so sometimes judges will put some something into the line or into the driver's briefing that is not there because they like it but because it's there to prevent something that you might not be aware of and they might not even mention um, they a good judge will but sometimes judges won't say why they've made a choice um but yeah and um yeah i think that's kind of it for the the, the main sort of beginner section like i say we're running a bit long because we've both been doing this a very long time and we've helped a lot <laughs> of people get into this hobby so we've seen Definitely. we've seen people uh make mistakes and we've seen people take the right route and fall in love with the hobby so um for us it's like i say it's all about getting more people involved in the hobby and I think there's also a lot of stuff left for future episodes. I mean, uh, yeah. for example, like uh, like how to start with setting up your car once you're actually driving, uh, what kind of upgrades to buy first. Uh, there's there's plenty of that stuff left, yeah. and I'm sure we'll get into that at a later time. Yeah. Um, so also, if you en enjoyed any of this or you thought it was helpful, um, let us know, because then we can do more of this. Um, like Like James said, we have a lot of experience, the both of us, with helping people out and getting started. I mean... Everyone who's in this hobby started at some point, so we all have some uh, advice to give. But and I think yeah, also, we're also it, happy to share. Hopefully, um, people will have found this information interesting. We're going to move on in a minute to to news and things like that. But if if you see people starting out that could use some solid advice, and you think the advice we've given is solid, link them to the video. Um, we see the amount of times I see the same questions getting asked on Facebook and different answers being given by different people, depending on who sees it um it's not to say that what we're saying is gospel or the only way to do things but like i say this comes from an awful lot of experience specifically in helping people start rc drifting and there's an awful lot of people that just myself over the years i've helped get into the hobby or stay interested in the hobby um so i think the advice that i shared is is good and solid you know it's um it's not guesswork it's based on years of giving it advice and seeing results from people and enjoying the hobby and you know sticking with the hobby for for a long time um yeah. so it's it's not the it's not the only way to get there but at least it's one of the ways to get there and um it's it's helped quite a few people so it's a, it's one of the better ways to get there yeah the uh martin's just said which is maybe a good good option for us in the future he wants to be in a video sharing soldering tips uh martin is the guy that runs the cookies shop in denmark in copenhagen and he is very good at soldering and he's the guy that normally solders my cars because he's better than me. Um, but yeah, anyway, so should we move on to some news that I was supposed to do at the start but messed up the order? <laughs> sure. So if you're not new and you're re-watching this video, yeah. then uh, you can skip straight to this point pretty yeah. much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I guess the, the first thing we'll, we'll get to is the stuff you've been up to. Yeah, I've been busy uh, the last week. Um, I'm, I'm actually still, uh, still at work every day, so I don't have as much spare time as some people. Actually, we've been very busy, but I, uh, I finally got the, the wheels and the tires that we talked about a couple of weeks ago in. So I, uh, I got the brand new MST White Dot tires. They are the low grip tires that probably work pretty well on carpet. Um, problem now is that I cannot test, obviously. Uh, we're all uh, sticking at home and at work. Um, but I also got the high traction wheels to, from MST. So these are the MST TSP model, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I uh, I did a little bit of a mix and match because I have the five mil offsets in the front and the sevens in the rear. So I just basically bought two sets and shared it with a friend, um, which That's is a, a good way to it. do it. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, so these are the high traction models, so they're a bit softer um, and they also look awesome. I have the exact same version of this wheel uh, in the normal version, the old one, uh, and they do feel a lot softer. Um, I'm not going to squeeze them like you see on some of the example uh, pictures because then I might end up with egg-shaped uh, wheels, which I don't yeah. want, especially when they're brand new. But uh, yeah, it's promising. So if I, uh, if I get to test them, I'll, I'll let everyone know uh, if they work or not. But, yeah, uh, I love the look of these wheels. <laughs> they I look think, great yeah i think I, I think i've said it when we showed them before i think they're one of the best looking wheel designs that's out there yeah um yeah and, I'm, uh, I'm not even sure if i want to go fluorescent yellow with them on this or keep them white i think in white it also suits the car i looks, think i think good. white's cool i think i'd probably buy another set to paint so you've got both options but uh yeah then i have to buy another two sets because yeah. then I, can... <laughs> I have the offsets again yeah but yeah, so this uh, this is new. So I'm uh, I'm excited to give this a try. So I hope uh, I can get out to a track uh, soon. 
or maybe even get some carpet myself and get yeah. going somewhere local. That's and, uh, uh, probably yeah. a whole other conversation for another time, I guess, that one. <laughs> but uh, Definitely. And you've also been doing something non-drifty. Yes, I'm still waiting for my masking tape to arrive, <laughs> as we've mentioned in the previous episode. It's... I have I have one of the packs that I need right here, and I need a few more, but they're still on their way from Japan. So Maybe that's uh, another been... beginner's tip, is just buy more masking tape and stock up. Yes, buy loads. Yeah. Uh, it's always good to have some. Um, but yeah, I've been just building a fun Tamiya kit. And since we've been talking about uh, cars for beginners, if you really, really are a beginner with RC, this is like the ultimate beginner car. Um, the this, only tools that I've needed to build it is this, the this little is, Tamiya cross range. How old is this? Because I've never seen one of these Nin before. 1997. So okay, this is uh, okay. just over 20 years old. Yeah. It's, uh, so it is it's a proper vintage chassis. Uh, depends on who you ask. I mean, yeah. some people say vintage has to be older than, I don't know, 1990 or something. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty old. But they're they're very cheap. And uh, yeah, you... You mentioned to me that it looks pretty small. Yeah, but it's well, actually it's funny because like it, it, it looks a lot like the the Tamiya uh, Mini Four Wheel Drive, especially with the yes. front bumper. So when I saw the picture on the box, I assumed it was one of those. So I uh, yeah, it's, it's put an Instagram it's post up on. saying that it took him about an hour to build, and I was like, "What? Yeah. How can something that small take an hour to build?" And um, yeah, then... it, it it has. Oh, I, th I thought you were surprised that it was quick. No, so no, no, were, no. You were surprised that it took me an hour no. to build a mini for Yeah, to build yeah. something that's this big. <laughs> I think those might actually take longer because there's a lot of yeah. little bits and bobs. If, you, if you're setting them up for, yeah. But uh, yeah. so this is a solid body, it looks like. Or yes, is it... it's a hard body indeed. Uh, with the optional spoiler, it's really needed because otherwise it looks a bit weird. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just a 110 scale four wheel drive uh, on road chassis with no suspension. No gearing options, nothing. It's like the the ultimate beginner's car. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun little thing. I'm still undecided if I want to paint it or just sticker it up straight away. But it's a it's a project to keep me busy um, while at home. I think it looks pretty cool, and it's the sort of like I say, I've said before, I like seeing stuff like this because this is the kind of thing I would never see otherwise. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of an oddball thing, and yeah, uh, yeah well, with it, a typical anime styling from the mini four wheel drives. I, I yeah, I like it. This is the kind of thing that like you've got to be into RC to look at this kind of thing now, or you've got to have one from back in the day. And uh, yeah, I just I would never have encountered this before. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so our first uh, first bit of news for this week, um, both of which we've shared today. Um, but we've got new VSKF wheels from Overdose, which I think is going to make a lot of people happy because these are now a black chrome. Um, previously, they've done matte chrome and chrome, and now they've got black matte chrome and black chrome, and um, just makes them a bit darker and a bit of, bit of a fresh look. These are such a popular wheel design that people have been running them for years since they first came out. I don't even know what year it was, but it's at least five years, I think, since these came out. And, um, I think these might be the first overdose wheels that came out, right? The VSKFs. No, uh, the, the CR Kawami is the first. I'm pretty sure, just going on part number. But um, yeah, they're they're old anyway. But they're they're yeah. still such a cool design for anyone who wants to run any any VIP kind of thing or any cool FC or something like that. Um, and the, one of the things that maybe people don't realise is that overdose are the the sort of world expert in plating um, wheels for RC. They're if you've ever run overdose chrome wheels or matte chrome wheels, they basically don't take any damage. You you have to work really hard to scratch them up. Um, a lot of the other chrome wheels, you know, a little knock or a little wheel to wheel contact or something like that, and they're suddenly marked. And when you've got a chrome wheel that then has like yellow plastic underneath or something like that, it just looks yeah. they're, they're scrap. You know, it doesn't they don't look right anymore. Um, I've, whereas... never, I've never noticed this, but you're you're definitely right. Like some other brands, they they chip super easily. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's actually you, you something... get like the, mil the milky white sort of semi-transparent yeah, plastic like beneath it. the old uh, vintage telephone colored wheels or something like that. But uh, yeah. Yeah. it's something that Overdose are really proud of um, and something they took a while to to get right and now and nobody's caught them up. Um, so it's, it's less uh, important these days, but back in the CS days, if you ran the Overdose Chrome or Mac Chrome, they just lasted forever. Um, and also these wheels are so strong that like they don't bend, they don't egg, they don't warp, they don't do any of that. These are not high traction wheels. These are absolutely <laughs> solid. You know, 
you could probably break something else instead of these wheels. Um, I've never damaged one of these. I've never, I don't even think I've scratched a VSKF wheel. I haven't run them for a while, uh, but I used to run them back in the day. And I think, uh, yeah, it's cool. They're, they're, I think they're pretty affordable. Uh, they're sold in pairs and they've got five mil and seven mil offset available in both the Mac black chrome and the black chrome. And they are 1400 yen. So they're the same price as normal overdose wheels. Uh, which is quite good um but yeah i'll definitely be getting a few just to give me more options um i actually have some of the chrome ones waiting still in the packet waiting for my uh <laughs> haraguchi replica that's still no closer to being done um and other news from overdose today um they've introduced um well they've remanufactured the black spacer um that they've done before and they've now introduced red and purple options these are just aluminium simple wheel spacers um and basically the reason you get a one mil and a half mil um, is because Overdose recommend that you can use up to 1.5 mil spacer in their wheels. So you can mm. use all of these on your car if you wanted one and a half mil spacing all the way around. And um, yeah, they won't damage your Overdose wheels. Um, I've seen people it, run more. Is, I wouldn't recommend it. It is indeed a bit of an Overdose thing to have the color matching fancy uh, shims on your wheels, but... What I like about these, and I also have a set from RC96 that yep. have the same, um, but they're a bit harder to get now, uh, but that the size is laser etched into it. Yes. Because I also have the ones without it from Tamiya, and you just, like, you're just like you just digging through a box to find that one particular space you yeah. need. And, and then you pull the out four size. of the wrong size before you find the one you need, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, um, or, you, or you find that you have one mil on one side and two mil on the other, um, yeah. just because they look the same. Um, well it, yeah. it, it's funny as well because i'm pretty sure the reason they've done uh, red and purple is because there's enough overdose fans out there that didn't run their black ones because they had a red or purple chassis and they will have been running another brand and so overdose have just given them the option to run something overdose on their you know on their chassis um but uh it, it's not a, a groundbreaking thing but it's a really hand, handy thing to have in your pit box if you don't have some wheel spaces yeah. i definitely recommend having some um i actually have the old black ones uh in my pit box at all times i also have a set of rc926 i think they are as well or maybe kn i can't remember I'm pretty sure 96 um that i also carry with me and some mst ones um purely because if i've got two chassis with me maybe i need a wheel spacer on both of them um and i don't take stuff out of my pit box very often so generally they just get dumped in there and left until i realize i haven't used them in a very long time <laughs> But like that's, I say, that's usually what happens for me as well. When you've you've taken them off because you don't need them, you drop them in a random box and then yeah, yeah, you well, um, just start think, with new ones again. I again. think the <laughs> timing of these coming out now is also because the one piece axle they've come out with recently means that people are changing the, their front setup um, a little bit, so it gives them options to get it sorted because the those uh, axles are available in four or six mil. So maybe if you go for the four mil, you need a little bit more. So this gives you the option to get to five and a half essentially um and then if that's not enough then you should have gone six mil um and if you're on six mil and you need more you still got the option so yeah it's like i say it's not a groundbreaking thing but it's, but it's cool to see them re-releasing them at a time when people might uh, are more likely to be needing them um, because like you say some of the other brands they're not so easy to get hold of sometimes then the wheel spaces have sort of fallen out of fashion a little bit over the last couple of years um it seems and a lot of manufacturers just haven't remanufactured uh, remade another batch so like I say, I've got plenty, and I know a load of guys that run them, but um, the MST ones are probably still quite easy to get hold of in Europe. But other than that, you probably you know, have to look at something that's not drift-related, um, which then yeah, means looking at shops. Ones. Yeah, looking at shops you don't know so well or, or things like that. So, um, yeah, it's good. Uh, they are, I forgot to check the price, uh, they're 1,800 uh, Japanese yen, so 15, 20 euros. I forget what that converts to these days. It's all changed too much, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're they're reasonably priced. Let's put it that way. Take take two zeros off and round up, then you're pretty much there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not with the pound anymore, unfortunately. That's how it used to be. But anyway, so um, yeah, that's that's kind of us for news this week. But we've got some well projects that people have been working on to cover. Yeah. So in the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, showing some of the projects that people have been building while uh, while at home, or maybe not even, but um, this is the, the perfect time to start building body shells since we are not able to go to tracks. Um, and there has been some progress as well. So let's, yeah. uh, let's have a look. So this was one yeah, we this... covered last week or the week before, I forget. 
I think two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. This is the uh, Parma pickup body shell from uh, Matthias, um, RC linked also on uh, social media. And uh, yeah, it's we, we covered it in the oddball category of uh, body shell, which is something Matthias really likes. Um, yeah. This one, uh, this one's definitely out there again. I mean, he has brass fittings. Yeah, he's gone for, for the detail uh, on it. fittings, yeah. Yeah. Oops. Copper trim all around the, the, the bed as well. So that one's uh, pretty crazy. Let's see the body. Uh, the picture. Sorry, I got <laughs> lost in my pictures. Um, but yeah, it's, like <laughs> I say, spoiler. like I said at the time, it's super cool to um, to to see something different. Um, it's not the first hot rod pickup I've seen drifting, but it's probably the second in ten years. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And then after this, as we just saw briefly, yeah, it's an uh, FC. So uh, this is uh, this is Saunders FC. The uh, He's been building quite a few body shells lately. This one's the, the newest. Um, so it's a Yokomo Samurai FC, uh, Master RX-7. Uh, Sonder is a huge, huge fan of RX-7s. He has three, I believe, real ones. Okay. Um, no, no FC though, um, FDs and uh, an FB, I think. But uh, yeah, so he, he loves RX-7s. Uh, he wanted to do an Itasha style build. So with the anime figurines and stuff on the side. Uh, and I think he actually had this livery custom made too, and all the the little extra stars and stuff added. Uh, I was gonna himself, say, I just so. I just saw the stars on the rear lights as well, which I missed before. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a theme going on. Um, yeah, it has a lot of really nice accessories, purple headlights, um, like quite a, quite a lot of custom bits here and there. Um, but I, uh, I I really like it. Looks yeah, good. I think it's it's cool and it's a different look as well. You don't see many Atasha bodies these days. Um, no, I was actually thinking about building one myself at some point. I. Uh, I got a Yokomo Aristo, so the Toyota Aristo body shell that came from Japan with the uh, Itasha style already drawn on the outside, but it wasn't masked yet. So maybe I need to keep it. Might uh, might be fun. And uh, so we've also got another follow up from again, I think probably two weeks ago, uh, which is Jason Lakes. Uh, I guess that's a Mark II Golf. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, I had to think for a second. Then I'm not so uh, not so into my VWs. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is uh, a nice bit of progress. And I think I might be wrong, but I think he's built the garage as well um, <laughs> while he's been been off. But yeah, it's kind of cool to see. Um, and I keep meaning to do it, but I keep forgetting to shout out. Jason's got a, uh, he started a uh, an RC drift group in, um, I think it's in Essex. I'm just pulling up the info because I forgot to have it to hand, but called RC. <laughs> uh, let's wait until I got the info before I mess it up. Uh, but he has got it, and it's called uh, RC Drift Monkeys, and they are on Facebook. Um, yeah, he's. I'm pretty sure he's based in Essex, uh, but the information is on his Facebook group called RC Drift Monkeys. Um, he basically started out so him and his son have somewhere to go and drift uh, locally. Ah, oh, there you go, it's in Southend. And they've been running for about six months and got a decent number of people running. So uh, if you're in that neck of the woods, especially if you're a beginner, uh, I'd definitely go and check it out because those guys are relatively new on their journey with rc drifting as well so they can they can probably give you some tips and tricks um from yeah, based on their experience tag along with their, you can easily tag along with their progress as well then yeah exactly exactly yeah. and then uh after jason's golf we've also got mick caldwell's new evo um which uh of course is has livery by um zero max um which looks super cool uh, it's, it's, you don't see many Evos done these days. Um, and I think it's getting harder and harder to get hold of that body, but I might be wrong on that. But it's, I just haven't seen any. It's, it's, it's not too bad. The Yokomo one is a bit harder to find. Um, yeah. If anyone's looking for one, I'm going to put one up for sale tonight. But you, that, that you can also still get the one from uh, from Tamiya or uh, from Killer Body, yeah. actually. I, think, I, think, that I this think the one, Yokomo this one might is... be the Killer Body one or not. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with them enough to know, but the um, the Yokomo one is is super cool. Um, if it's if it's a killer body one, it looks super cool too. Um, yeah, it's not the Yokomo one, I don't think. Um, I don't know. Like no. I say, the the Yokomo has different vents, I think. Yeah, that's, that's what that's what I'm looking for. Um, but yeah. yeah, he's done the super chunky lips, which kind of looks cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, it looks cool. Um, it's it's funny. Having done this hobby for so long, when I see Evos and Impressors, I always like them. Even though they're sort of older bodies now, they always look cool. And I think it's because you don't see many. And I think it's kind of hard to mess them up. They're, they're a cool, chunky sh shape that just looks cool when it's drifting. Um, oh, it's, it's definitely not something for me. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, I, I, I've never understood the Evos and the Subarus, but that's, uh, that's me. I'm, I'm sticking with my Toyotas. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> when you get stuck in a rut, sometimes it's hard to get out, but, uh, it no, is. I, uh, yes. I like it. I think it's cool. Um, but yeah, I think that's us just about done. So, uh, we've gone a bit longer this time. Uh, so sorry if we waffled on a little bit. But uh, I did see somebody's just asked in chat, uh, what is the best car for a beginner? I would recommend, George, that you watch this from the beginning because we've covered that yeah. right at the start and um, and most of the way through, <laughs> I think. Yeah, but just so. wait a little bit and it will be uh, available for playback on YouTube. Yes, and then you yeah. can, uh, give, it, it um, give it maybe 10 minutes and you can start from the beginning uh, or watch it another day. But yeah, well, thanks for joining us, guys, and thanks for everyone that stuck around for the entire uh, two hours or whatever it is close to. Um, Almost, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, much appreciated. And like I said before, if you found this info helpful or if you think it would benefit a, a new guy asking questions, just send people to this video because um, it saves the same questions being asked over and over if you liked our answers, if you agreed with them. Um, and it also supports the channel and motivates us to keep doing them, which is always good. Definitely. And if, if there's anything missing information, then yep. uh, just uh, send us some questions, send us some comments, and we'll... Uh see if we can fit them in in one of the next episodes. Yeah, and feel free to drop a comment below with your recommendations for beginners since we expect beginners to, to use this video as a bit of a reference. It does mean also uh, it can sit there and be seen by anyone. And if anyone's dumps any bad advice, I might delete it or leave a comment, uh, <laughs> leave a comment countering why I don't agree with that. But, uh, but yeah, uh, all comments are welcome, so go for it. But yeah, well, we'll be back next week. Uh, hopefully with some more news for you guys and if not we'll come up with another topic like tonight to uh to get a bit of a discussion going so i hope you enjoyed it and thanks again to everyone who joined us for the chat um it's uh it's always good for the to have the questions flowing in and we'll uh we'll see yeah. you next week thanks, thanks for watching bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.